Hi, welcome to One Eye on the Page. This is Scott. It's time for the May wrap up. I read 13 books in May. Nine of them were novels, two non fiction books, one book of poetry, and one short story collection. I'm going to let you know what I read in order of preference from worst to best. The worst book of the month. And usually I wouldn't say worst. I might say something like least liked or the book I preferred the least. But worst is an apt adjective here. The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F by Mark Manson is the worst book that I read. Not only in May, but probably in years. Now I will say... I'm generally not a big self-help person. I, I love to read nonfiction, obviously not as much as fiction, but generally self-help is not the category that I read. It, it is what I thought it was going to be, which was very limited amount of useful information followed by pretty much repetition of what useful information there was and then also a bunch of moronic information this is just a poorly written poorly researched book it is just a guy bsing his way and contradicting himself i don't know that i can pick up another self-help book for quite a while just because of this experience I get kind of shell-shocked just thinking about it. If you're the type of person who likes self-help books, I would obviously never steer you away from them because I think people should read what they like to read. I would only caution you, there are probably better self-help books out there for you than this one. I feel worse for having read it. And it's only a little hyperbole. Twelfth best book of the month. I, I, I won't give this one too much hate. It's Louder and Funnier by P.G. Woodhouse. It was not what I was looking for in a P.G. Woodhouse book. I have never read nonfiction by P.G. Woodhouse before. I have read two books about Woodhouse that were nonfiction, one a collection of his letters and another a biography, but I have never read his nonfiction. His, his humor does not work as well in nonfiction as it does in fiction. It's kind of the thing where, you know, you expect, let's say, Jim Carrey to be like, uproariously funny all the time but for better or worse Jim Carrey being himself I not necessarily that funny when he paints the quality of which it is up to you as you prefer two he has questionable opinions at least in the past I don't know about now but questionable opinions about uh, autism then I'll leave it at that the person that we look to in admiration for what they present us Jim Carrey for his, his humor and P.G. Woodhouse for his fiction it, it doesn't work as well when we're kind of seeing the person behind it and not to say that the writer of these essays is the P.G. Woodhouse that his family and friends might know but it, it's having read about him it is a little bit more of the type of person he is he his humor's more cutting than it is in his own fiction and he when he writes about characters like Bertie Wooster or or anybody at Blanding's Castle we're able to laugh at them a little bit and with them 
because they're a little bit ridiculous. The P.G. Woodhouse that he presents in these essays is a little bit ridiculous, but he doesn't welcome laughing at all. There, there were some funny moments in it, but overall I didn't enjoy the essays. It was about stuff that I didn't particularly care about. Hollywood, writing in Hollywood in like the 1920s and 30s. Tennis, butlers. I don't particularly care about butlers unless I'm reading like a Jeeves story. And Jeeves is not a butler, he's a valet. And having an internal debate with myself whether or not we're going to even touch Woodhouse's nonfiction when Robin and I do the podcast. Book number 10, Agatha Raisin in the Keisha Death by M.C. Beaton, which is the last M.C. Beaton book that I plan on reading. Who knows where life will take us? Maybe I will come to you someday and say, I'm reading an M.C. Beaton book again. But I've read like 10, I think, nine of them, uh, the Hamish Macbeth series in this first one from the Agatha Raisin series. I, I discussed it a lot in my vlog. It's a Miss Marple who's cranky and bitter, not as smart, self-centered. She does grow a little bit during the novel. The mystery wasn't particularly compelling. And overall, I was just glad to have finished it without, well, not throwing the book across the room because I listened to it as an audio book. But I really would have been upset if I ended up throwing my phone across the room. It was like I survived that. And it wasn't an awful book, but there was nothing in it that made me think, I should read the second book. So the one thing about MC Beaton books is they're very short. If you run upon any of these books and you want a quick read, they're there. But if you're looking for mystery or you're, if you're looking for compelling characters, I don't know that these necessarily are the books that you would want. Those three books are basically the bottom pile some of the other books i probably won't read again but i think i felt i felt they were quality reads two of these books i probably wouldn't have finished if it wasn't for the fact that i had at some point said i was going to read them if i'd done it in secret and nobody knew i was going to read them i probably would have been like you know what i'll just I probably would have finished Agatha Raisin regardless, especially because it's audiobook. It's easier for me to finish audiobooks than it is physical books. We have Tortilla Flat by John Steinbeck. It is not top tier Steinbeck. It's not of Mice and Men or Grapes of Wrath, which are the only other two Steinbeck novels that I have read. It's decent. The Characters are nowhere near as compelling as in the aforementioned novels. It's an interesting device that Steinbeck uses, writing early 20th century paisanos as essentially knights of the round table who often speak with these and thines, etc. But it feels like a gimmick. And you can have a gimmick and have it being compelling, or you can have a gimmick and you're like, oh, that's a gimmick. And that's all you can think about is like, oh, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for another thou, a thine, a thee. Basically a collection of knight's tales from Knights of the Round Table, but on adventures I didn't particularly care about. I am glad that I have read it. I do still want to read other Steinbeck novels, but this one is not one I'm ever going to read again. 50 Words for Rain by Ash Shalemi. I said quite a bit about this in one of my vlogs. Actually, I've said quite a bit about this in several of my vlogs because it took me a while to read it because it was just hard to get into because perhaps it's a, a cultural thing 
it's set in Japan. And I don't understand all the Japanese culture. I don't think that's it, but I just couldn't get over the main character, Nori, her treatment in the novel, and then her reaction at the end of the novel. It didn't make any sense to me. And I understand that people often do things that aren't in their own self-interest and that people don't learn things and people don't improve. But just the way this novel was written, it was conditioned in me to expect a change in the character at the end of the novel. And I will try not to spoil it too much, but one spoiler is that no, there's not much of a change in the character. There's not much of a change in any of the characters in the novel, except that they get older and, you know, some of getting older seeps into it. But other than that, there, there's not a lot of change. So I complained enough about it in the blogs. If you're particularly interested, please feel free to listen to me go off on a rant. The next book, number eight, is one that I just finished today, the last day of the month, Spoon River Anthology by Edgar Lee Masters, which is a collection of poems. It's free verse poetry about the citizens of Spoon River. It's their voices in the graveyard sometime after they have died, talking about how they died, why they died, secrets that they had. There are different characters touching on some of the same topics, but you have different points of view on it. I'm not a poetry hater, but I'm not a huge poetry guy. As a book of poetry, it was pretty good. If you are in the poetry, you have either already read this, or this may be one that you would enjoy. If you're a poetry reader, it probably would be higher up on the list for you than it is for me. Book number seven is Authentically Izzy by Pepper Basham. It's kind of interesting to me that this book is right in the middle of my 13 books because I wouldn't have thought after I had read it that it would be there. I thought it would be a little bit closer to the bottom, which perhaps says something about the books that are on the bottom. It is an epistolary novel. It's emails and text exchanges and dating site messages and an occasional third-person narrative break-in which is a lot of the reason why it's ranked lower for me than it might have been. There's nothing new about this. It's, it's a romance between oh, a woman in America and a man outside of Scotland. I believe he's between Wales and Scotland. It's nothing groundbreaking, but the characters are interesting enough. I just, I didn't really enjoy the epistolary part that much and at the point that I was going like okay I accept this but how are they gonna show them meeting in the romance part in letters and emails etc they weren't that's where the third person narrator came in and I don't accept that maybe if you read it you're like yeah okay that's the only way you can do it. I understand. I can get past that. I can't get past that. So that's why it's not higher up. Book number six is If I Were You by P.G. Woodhouse. This is not a very well-known Woodhouse novel. In fact, I had to purchase it on Amazon from not a normal publishing company. As far as Woodhouse novel go, it's not particularly inventive or innovating. The, the humor is there, but I don't think the character work is there as much. And character motivation, especially in the mother's part. And whose mother? Well, 
I guess I kind of have to explain what the novel is about to, to let you know that. There is a, an earl and a barber. And they are switched at birth. Of course, the guy's not a barber when he's a baby. But one comes from a family of royalty and one comes from a family of barbers. They are switched at birth by the Earl's mother, the Earl actually being the barber. And so the Earl, who becomes the barber, is switched by the woman that he thinks is his mother, but is actually the Earl's mother. So that the mother is spending pretty much all her life with the barber who is not actually her son and not spending most of her life with the Earl who is and who was supposed to be a barber. So I think that explains it pretty well or not well, which is what you may feel when you're reading it. It's mid-level Woodhouse. If you like Woodhouse, you'll probably enjoy it, but probably not a book that you'll go back to many times. If if I had a choice between reading The Worst of Blanding's Castle or Jeeves and Worcester in this book, I'd pick up a Jeeves and Worcester or a Blanding's Castle. Book number four is Glass Ocean by Beatrice Williams, Lauren Willock, and Karen White. It's mainly set in 1915 on the Lusitania, but also has one part in 2013. It's with three different main characters, a writer in 2013, and two women on the Lusitania in 1915, one who is a first-class passenger and the other is a second-class passenger and also a con woman. And it's and the uh, the writer is like the great granddaughter of somebody else who was on the Lusitania when it sank, and he he died. We know that at the beginning, so it's not a big spoiler. We're close to the beginning. It's a good story. I enjoyed it for the most part. My big problem with it is that there were a few characters mainly the men whose motivation and actions didn't really make any sense to me, except that they were for the plot. And there are characters like Tess's, the con woman, sister Ginny, who we're told really loves her sister, but we're never shown that. So I, I have a problem with, telling not showing so that's why i don't enjoy this as much as i might have but i still thought it was a good it was a good book it was interesting it had a little bit of mystery in it had a little bit of romance in all three sections of it to varying degree i preferred the 2013 version a little bit more than the 1915 version it's a possibility of rereading, not likely, but it's there. Number three is The Golden Compass, which is the first book in the Historic Materials trilogy by Philip Pullman. I said in my vlog when I first started this that I didn't like it, that I was kind of done with The Chosen Ones, uh, which this character Lyra is, but Pullman wrote her well enough that I I began to side with her. I, I'm done with stupid, mopey, I guess I'll do what I have to do, chosen ones. Lyra, does, despite being a 12-year-old girl, asks questions and has her own motivations, and she... For a 12-year-old, she doesn't take any crap. And I, I like that. I 
will probably read the second book at some point. Not anytime soon. I don't think the book is so good that I have to know what happens next. But it does have me where like, I would like to know what happens next and I will at some point. Uh, book number two is volume one of Collected Short Stories by Guy de Maupassant, a French writer uh, from the mid-19th century. He was born in 1850, died in 1893 of syphilis. But uh, some call him the father of the short story. Makes sense. Uh, All the stories in volume one that I read are centered around the Franco-Prussian War. One that's definitely a masterpiece, a classic. Bull de Swift. Sorry for my mispronunciation. None of the stories are particularly happy ending ones it's great character sketches thoughts on war and patriotism if you have like prussian ancestors you may not enjoy it too much because he does kind of stereotype them a little bit overall i really enjoyed the short stories i am going to be reading the rest of the collection i know he also has novels I don't know if I will read those or not, but I probably have at least 12 more books of short stories that I will get through. Book number two, The Marlowe Murder Club by Robert Thorogood. It's a cozy murder mystery, but set in in modern times with another Miss Marple type character, except she's cranky and probably drinks too much whiskey. I wouldn't say cranky, secretive and a bit of a loner until she gets her own little crime solving gang, a vicar's wife and a dog walker, and also consults with a police detective. It's it was a good mystery. I did solve it like instantaneously about three quarters of the way through that. And it's just it's something that came to me. It's not anything that I was like, you know, I wasn't doing the sunny in Philadelphia thing with all the twine and everything that did bring it down just a tear. It might have been my number one book of the month if it wasn't for that. But it's still a good mystery. I just, I got the flash and knew what happened. But the characters also have death. Usually in mysteries, the the detectives aren't built up particularly well as characters. And I think that that is different here. And I will be able to tell you for sure because the second book in it death comes tomorrow is published and i'm going to be reading that probably this month when you see this this month in june if you want a good mystery stay away from agatha raisin and read the marlow murder club and my number one book of the month which i'm a little bit surprised that is kiss her once for me by allison cochran a little bit surprised because I did read a book by her previously, The Charm Offensive, which I really liked. I may have liked it more than this one. Maybe not. I, the ending of The Charm Offensive was a little too hokey for me. So that may make this novel surpass that one, which is humorous because when I say hokey, This book is definitely hokey. It is essentially a Hallmark Christmas movie, but with lesbians and also mental health issues. But it's just done so well, and I'm somebody who likes Hallmark Christmas movies. And the characters are flawed, so flawed but you still care about them.
and that's the problem with a lot of books is like the writers think that you have to love the characters and think they're perfect or you're not going to care and it's like these are not perfect characters and it's fine but i can i can see myself in them i can see other people in my life in them they're messy and screwed up and they're also great so that is my number one book i didn't even tell you about it though did i uh Two women get together on Christmas Eve one year. They have like an amazing night. Something goes wrong that we don't know what it is uh, at the beginning. And Ellie loses a girl, loses her job, has a horrible mother. She meets Andrew or she, she knows Andrew and they make an arrangement to get married so that he can inherit money again. Hokey, it is. But... She has to go to his family's for Christmas. And who is there but the girl she was with the year before, and it's Andrew's sister, Jack. Comedy, tragedy, romance ensues. And it's very good. Overall, it was okay. The month. That book was great. But overall, the month was okay. I I had three books that sucked. I had three books that I would say were great that i would read again i everything else in between was okay to good not likely to be repeaters so thank you for visiting one eye on the page please like and subscribe and i will see you next time